Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Fracknoy. I'm the Emeritus Professor of Astronomy at Foothill College, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the 23rd year of the Silicon Valley Astronomy Lectures. Uh, we're old enough to vote now. Uh, this has been a, a very wonderful project sponsored by four distinguished organizations, the Foothill College Science, Technology, Engineering and Math Division, the SETI or Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and the University of California Observatories, which includes the Historic Lick Observatory, as well as a number of others. And we're very grateful for their support uh, with the lecture series. Uh, we're able to bring you these lectures uh, live and recorded on YouTube thanks to an anonymous donation by a supporter who continues to support us year after year, and we're very grateful for that as well. Uh, I want to remind everyone that if you want to subscribe in the sense of be notified of new lectures, uh, you can hit the subscribe button on YouTube, but also make sure you hit the notification bell. It's a two-step process. And as we always do at the end of the talk, we're going to take questions and we ask you to email those questions to Dr. Jeff Matthews, the professor of astronomy at Foothill College who will be curating your questions. And the way to do that is to email astronomy at foothill.edu. And that address will flash on the bottom of your screen as you go through. So we encourage you to ask questions throughout or at the end. All right, so with those announcements, I want to now get into tonight's lecture. Uh, the beginning of our 23rd year is a, a speaker who I'm delighted to welcome uh, to our series, Dr. Victoria Caspi. Uh, uh, Dr. Caspi holds the Lorne Trottier Chair in Astrophysics and Cosmology at McGill University in Canada and is the inaugural director of the McGill Space Institute. She uses techniques of radio and X-ray astronomy to study some of the most complicated and violent objects in the universe, pulsars, neutron stars, magnetars, all of which represent the last stage in the life of really massive stars. Since 2014, she's been working on the topic of tonight's lecture, fast radio bursts, a whole new phenomenon in the astrophysical sky. She is presently the principal investigator on the CHIME Fast Radio Burst Project, which is the most promising instrument for investigating this new series of mysterious signals. Professor Caspi has been the recipient of numerous awards and honors, including the prestigious Shaw Prize in Astronomy in 2021, that's considered by many to be the Nobel Prize of Astronomy and the 2022 Albert Einstein World Award of Science. Uh, tonight, she's going to fill us in on fast radio bursts, the fast radio sky, in fact, which is a new window on the violent universe. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor for me to present to you Dr. Victoria Caspi. Hello, and thank you so much for that very generous uh, introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. I, I'm, I'm just delighted uh, to be able to uh, talk with you and share with you uh, some of what I'm uh, I'm working on along with my uh, team he uh, here in Montreal. I'm in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, uh, 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 al along with astronomers across Canada and as you'll see in the United States as well. So I think I'll uh, go ahead and share my um, my screen. Oops, I just jump to the start. There we go. There's the first uh, first slide. I hope everybody can see that. Uh, yes, the fast radio sky, a new window on the violent universe. Um, you know, when people ask me, uh, Vicky, what do you work on? Um, I tell them, I don't know. I don't actually know what I'm working on right now. 
Uh, it's a, a big mystery. This is a, one of the most interesting mysteries, I think, in, in astrophysics today. And as I'm going to share with you how this mystery has been unraveling with lots of interesting twists and turns, it's actually an interesting study in just how science is, uh, science is done overall. Uh, you're going to see all sorts of surprises along the way that were truly surprising even to the, to the people who were very deeply involved. Um, these fast radio bursts have gotten uh, quite a bit of press. If you if you Google fast radio bursts, you'll see them all, all over the popular press, uh, uh, all newspapers, uh, magazines, um, all over the place because they are really um, quite a puzzle. And um, but I want to explain first of all, make sure everybody's on the same page when I say a radio burst. What do I mean by a radio burst? And so I've put an object here, which people of a certain generation will, will recognize as a radio. Uh, the younger people might not know what this thing is, but so let me walk you through what this object is. Uh, this is a device that has an antenna that um, receives radio waves that propagate through space and converts them into an into a electric current that can then be analyzed using amplifiers. And uh, this antenna collects radio waves of what we say are many different frequencies. Uh, and this is a device, in, inside the radio is a device where you can turn this little knob here and choose what radio frequency you want to hone in on. Uh, and you can see here in this case, it's at about 102 megahertz. That's in the FM band. That's a, that's the number of oscillations per second, million about a hundred million oscillations per second of this of this radio wave, and that gets converted, as I said, into currents that then uh, are are converted into sound waves. So radio waves are not sound waves, even though we can hear they, they encode sound into them. But a speaker is what converts the electronic. Uh, the signals into uh, the sound waves that you can eventually hear as a, as a lovely, uh, uh, you know, song or, or, or whatever you're listening to. Uh, but the main point is that it, this device picks out a certain radio frequency, and, and I'm going to come back to that. And so, so radio waves, very different from sound waves. In fact, radio waves are just another form of light and another form of what we call the of electromagnetic waves that is oscillating. You don't have to worry too much about this, but electric and magnetic fields of which you're really familiar. Your eyes detect electromagnetic waves in the visible portion of what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. So your eyes are excellent at detecting this portion of a vast spectrum of these waves. And radio waves are just another type of that light, but your eyes are not, are not sensitive to it. So even though there's radio waves flying all around you right now, you, you, can't, see, you can't see them. Uh, now, if you know people had evolved with giant antennas for eyes, then you'd be seeing them, but uh, we didn't. And uh, now, of course, all these other types of electromagnetic waves you're, you're familiar with, X-rays, gamma rays, those are much higher energy. Radio waves are the lowest energy of all, uh, the, of all the electro, uh, types of electromagnetic uh, light. And so it's um, flashes of radio waves that we're talking about here. So what it, what do we when we say fast radio bursts? What we're talking about are very short bursts of radio waves. When I say short, I mean lasting only a few thousandths of a second, a few milliseconds. And and this is a phenomenon that um, was only fairly recently uh, recognized. The first one was discovered in uh, 2007 using this radio telescope. This is the uh, a famous radio telescope in Par in Parks, Australia. You can see here, this is a, about a, a dish that has about a diameter of about 64 meters. And this is a three-story building that's uh, right below there. It's actually where I did my PhD thesis. It's really wonderful. Uh, and um, so it detected the very first fast radio burst. And, and today we know that these are not rare events. We can estimate how many are occurring across the whole sky. If you could observe the entire sky every day, you would detect, roughly speaking, about a thousand of these events every single day. So these bursts of radio waves, it's not something unusual or uncommon. It's something very, very common, but we don't know what they, what they, what's causing them. Their origin is unknown. 
And one thing that I can say with certainty is that they're not microwave ovens. And you might wonder, what is she talking about? And I'll come back to that point. Now you might wonder, okay, how do you see them? What, how, how do you see these things? Here's a, a, a big radio telescope. Actually, I think this is the one in China, the fast radio telescope. This is definitely not how we detect radio waves. You don't see the flash because radio waves are invisible to the eye. Let me show you how astronomers actually see fast radio bursts. Here is what we call the Lorimer burst. This was the first fast radio burst ever detected in 2007. This is a plot where we've taken the signal that's been detected by the antenna at the focus of the telescope, and then converted uh, into signals that are amplified, brought down, and then digitized. And so these are, I'm showing you digital samples. The X, the, the horizontal axis here is time. And, and this is a total of about half a second, half a second or 500 milliseconds. And the Y axis here is radio frequency. So now um, it's not like in the radio where we're just choosing one frequency. These, this event produce, w w consisted of a whole spectrum of radio waves all, at many, many different frequencies. And the antenna on a radio telescope can detect all those frequencies at the same time. We don't have to choose. So that's what the Y axis is, is all the different radio frequencies. And here, this horizontal line here that's at just one fixed radio frequency and is on for all time. That's actually a television station. That's annoying. That's a nuisance. We don't like that. The actual astrophysical signal, the burst, is this thing that's sweeping through the band that arrives at the highest radio frequencies first at earliest times and then is delayed at the lower radio frequencies. It sweeps through. And this, this sweep is key because when the, astron uh, the first astronomers to detect this saw that sweep, they knew that this signal was coming from far, far outside our Milky Way galaxy. They knew in fact that it was likely coming from what we call a cosmological distance that is across the uh, uh, from the furthest reaches of the universe. And you can say, well, how could they know that just from that sweep? And I'm gonna explain because it's really important to the story. Um, this inset here is what you get if you in software correct for this, uh, what we call dispersion for the fact that the, 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 the signal has swept through the band. If in software you line all these signals up, which is how it was produced at the source, and that's really important, then you get this inset. So this is just the sum of all the signal corrected. This, it's straightened out vertically and then summed across all radio frequencies. And what you see is nothing at first, just noise. Then the big burst that lasts just a few milliseconds, and then it disappears and it does not come back. So that's the fast radio burst. Now, let me explain about how we know that these bursts are coming from so far away. And first, let me just make sure everybody's on the same page about what I mean by far outside our Milky Way galaxy. So this is a galaxy. You can be certain this is not the Milky Way galaxy because it's very hard to take a picture of the outside of your house when you're sitting in it. So this is some other galaxy that looks a lot, we think it looks a lot like the Milky Way galaxy. And, and we, our uh, Earth is uh, somewhere on the, on the edge of the galaxy over here. Um, that's about the extent, uh, extent of it. And, and let me just, you know, sort of describe what I mean by the furthest reaches of the universe. Let's just under, be sure we understand the scale of the universe, make sure everybody's on the same page here. So everybody recognizes the Earth in this figure here. And now, if we zoom out from this figure, we go to this figure and the earth is now the little red dot there. It's written earth in, 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 uh, in red and pointing to a dot that is really tiny on the scale of the entire solar system with the sun, of course, in the, in the center. But then if you zoom out from there, the entire solar system now just looks like a bit of a dot when we talk about the uh, nearest stars to ours, the interstellar neighborhood. So these are the closest stars to us in the galaxy. Uh, now, if you zoom out uh, even further, the entire interstellar neighborhood is now just a tiny dot uh, on the edge of the Milky Way galaxy, like I showed you before. But if you continue zooming out out of the Milky Way galaxy, you get to what we call the local galactic group. 
where you can see the Milky Way galaxy is that little smudge over there. And uh, over here is the Andromeda galaxy, some of you might be familiar with. But you can zoom out of the local galactic group as well. And you find that the local galactic group is part of uh, the Virgo supercluster uh, of, of galaxies. And so now the entire local galactic group is just a smudge. And you can continue to zoom out to all the local superclusters of galaxies where now the Virgo supercluster itself is just a smudge. And then you can continue <laughs> zoom out and you reach, you reach a scale where the universe starts to look pretty homogeneous. And the entire local supercluster is now just a smudge. And what I'm trying to tell you is that fast radio bursts we know are coming from this scale, from the scale of the entire observable universe, that is from cosmological distances where, um, uh, uh, you know, not, no, not all of them are coming from there, but some of them definitely are. And so let me explain a little more about that, how we know. Now, how do we know? So I mentioned this dispersion of radio waves, the fact that the signal flies through the, the band, the band past the, 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 the high frequencies arrive below low frequency, uh, before uh, the lower frequencies. And uh, we call that dispersion. And you're actually very familiar with dispersion of light. Uh, maybe not with dispersion of radio light, but certainly with dispersion of optical light, because uh, you know that white light is actually made up of the colors of the rainbow. If you take uh, a white light beam and you, you, what we call analyze it or just send it through this prism, what you find is that the different colors get deflected by different amounts and it splits the white light into different colors. So different colors get spread out when they pass through a different medium, like in this case, glass. And what might not be so clear from the prism is that the different colors also travel at different speeds in that, uh, in that material. And so not only are they spread out in space, but they're also spread out in time uh, and not by very much, but by enough. And of course, this is uh, the cause, uh, the, 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 the angular dispersion, that is the dispersion in space is what is uh, the origin of the of rainbows. It's water droplets in that case. Now you might say, what that the different colors travel at different speeds? I thought the speed of light, the C and E equals MC square, the fa Einstein's famous equation, I thought C was a constant that the that it's a the law of light must travel at the speed of light, uh, and here I am telling you different colors travel at different speeds. What, what am I talking about? Well, that C is only a constant in a vacuum. So equal this C is the speed of light only when light is propagating in a vacuum. If light is propagating through a material. Ah, then it doesn't necessarily travel at the speed of light. It, it travels a little slower. And the speed depends on what color the light is. This, in other words, the speed depends on the frequency of that light. And space is not a vacuum. So this is, a, you, you could just see it with your own eyes. You don't need me to tell you. If you go out, nice clear sky, and you see here, for example, the plane of the Milky Way galaxy, you see there's all sorts of stuff in the galaxy. In this case, there's lots of dust. But in addition to dust, there's also lots of atoms. Uh, there's free electrons. Uh, specifically, I'm referring to free electrons. So there's atoms that are ionized where the electrons have been stripped off the atoms. And I'm referring, I'm ignoring dust here. I'm talking about these free electrons that happen to be in space as well. See the, the cute little little joke about ionizing, uh, you know, the atom has the protons and neutrons in the center, and then the electrons in the outside and the electron can get lost. And it's those free electrons that have been stripped off atoms in space, they are responsible for the dispersion of radio light. So just like glass disperses optical light, uh, free electrons in interstellar space disperse radio waves. And so the idea is here's Earth, and I'm going to show you a little video of a fast radio burst source producing all the colors of the rainbow, at least here it's going to be depicted optically so that your eyes can see it. And you, as they propagate through a medium that's ionized where there's free electrons, 
the radio waves will get dispersed. So there, they all start out, it starts at white, all the colors together. As it propagates, the higher frequency blue will arrive at earth before the lower frequency red. And that is the origin of the dispersion, the sweep in the fast radio burst signal that I showed you before. And so still, how does that tell us they're coming from cosmological distances? Well, again, um, if you consider a galaxy like our the Milky Way galaxy, in fact, imagine this were the Milky Way galaxy, we have actually studied the Milky Way galaxy's distribution of free electrons pretty well. And this, if you could look down on the Milky Way galaxy, this is a representation of the density, the numbers, the amount of free electrons that are present in our own Milky Way galaxy. So this is a, 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 a we know this, uh, we calibrate it with sources that are in our galaxy that produce short bursts of radio waves, radio pulsars. I could talk your ear off about them, but I won't. Um, but we know where the free electrons are in our galaxy. And we can make this beautiful galaxy dispersion contour plot. So this is a contour plot. Now where this little plus sign represents the center of our galaxy. And here you can see schematic spiral arms as if you're looking down on the galaxy and the little pac-man pac-man that's probably some of you will know what i'm talking about when i say pac-man uh it's an old video game the, the little creature here with the eyeball that's where the solar system is and so these are these lines are of constant what we call dispersion measure so amount the, the constant total number of free electrons between uh us in the solar system and the source and so what you see is if you could detect a source or a radio source, a bursting radio source in any direction by measuring the amount of dispersion, by measuring the tilt, how much dispersion there is in the radio signal, you know roughly how far away it is. Because we have maps, we know how many free electrons there are in the galaxy. And this model is not just two-dimensional, it's not just in the plane of the Milky Way galaxy, it's a three-dimensional model. So when you look in any direction on the sky and you see a radio burst and you measure its dispersion measure, this map of our galaxy should tell you how far away it is. And in particular, for every direction, there's a maximum meaning eventually the galaxy runs out of free electrons. As you get further and further from the center of the galaxy, there's fewer and fewer free electrons. And so for every direction on the sky, we know the maximum number of free electrons present um, uh, due to our own galaxy. So with all of that information, now you can understand how, why we jaws dropped when we saw this burst from the Parkes Observatory. The amount of dispersion here was in arcane units. Don't worry about the units, but in arcane dispersion units, 375. Whereas we knew from maps that we have made and independently calibrated of our Milky Way galaxy, we knew the maximum in that direction was only about 25. So it was more than 10 times the number of free electrons to were required to cause this amount of dispersion. And since you run out of free electrons outside the galaxy, and we know the intergalactic medium, that is the space between galaxies is very tenuous. There's very few free electrons there. In order to amass this total dis amount of dispersion, it had to be coming from not only way outside our galaxy, but from very, very far away from our galaxy. Um, and which implies if it's coming from so far out of our galaxy, it had to be quite a powerful source, something incredibly bright to have been so, so easily detectable here on Earth. So this is a, quite a shock. Um, and the Parkes Observatory, the astronomers there were pretty surprised and, um, you know, didn't know what to make of it. They published it in Science Magazine. It was quite a shock and everybody was scratching their heads about it. But they started detecting more and more of these things, except some of them looked a little odd. 
Here is an example of one of the parks uh, events, which they started calling peritons for some strange reason, mainly because they looked a little different. This is an example of one where that you see the frequency sweep, the high frequencies come before the low frequencies, just like in the very first burst I showed you, but you see it's kind of clumpy and it has kind of, it's not nice and smooth. Well, that was regarded as a little strange and nobody knew quite why that was, why some of them were like this and others were not. And there were other differences also that I'm not getting into. Um, but they started collecting, uh, detecting more and more of these and they noticed something very interesting. They decided to plot the times of day when these events arrived. And so this is a plot, it's called a histogram plot, where you see 24 hours, these are the times of the day in Australian times, the Australian Eastern Standard Time, and the total number of events, and the light gray ones are the weird ones, the ones with the funny frequency structure, and the dark gray ones are the ones that uh, don't have that funny frequency structure. And what they noticed is that the light gray ones, the weird ones, peaked, peaked at lunchtime, at lunchtime at the telescope. And so that was a clue because the cosmos shouldn't know when it's lunchtime. <laughs> like that makes no sense. And what they realized is that um, these events, the, the weird ones were actually coming from a local microwave oven when people were heating up their lunch. And it turns out that it's not just the microwave oven. The microwave oven doesn't just produce radio bursts. Only when the microwave oven was running and somebody was impatient and hungry and opened the microwave oven door before it was turned off, that made a radio burst, or at least the, the weird radio burst. And so that was quite a, a surprise. And, um, uh, you know, the telescope also had to be pointed in just the right direction toward the kitchen. There's a, there's a long road here. It goes to visitor's quarters and inside there's a kitchen. So if the telescope was pointed in the, not in the right direction, they didn't detect it. Uh, but it was a graduate student who uh, stood there at the microwave, opened it, closed it, opened it, closed it, and somebody watched the signal at the observatory and they figured this out. It's a really amazing story published in one of the most prestigious journals of astrophysical research, identifying the source of paratons. And you can see here, it says uh, they were generated at 1.4 gigahertz when a microwave oven door was opened prematurely and the telescope was at an appropriate relative angle. So I think this is beautiful. It's beautiful because it shows when science, when we figure things out, when we understand them, you know, we we publish it. This is um, we publish things that were mistakes. We understand it. We follow it up, um, and the, and really, then the outcome was that the other observational differences between the weird frequency structure ones that turned out to be the microwave oven and the actual cosmic ones, this solidified the existence of the cosmic ones. Um, because there was they, they were distributed uniformly in time, not peaking at any meal time. And so this, you know, really was uh, the genesis of this whole field. And people started asking questions. Well, what could these things be? It had to be some massive explosion. The, the real signals are coming from very far outside the galaxy. So some sort of exploding star that destroys itself or or maybe two neutron stars that collide or a neutron star that collides with a black hole. You know, there's all sorts of different ideas. One idea I'm gonna mention is, is magnetars. And I'll, I'll just say that very quickly and you'll see why later in the talk, why I'm mentioning magnetars as a model for FRBs in particular. Uh, so what is a magnetar? Uh, magnetars are very highly magnetized young neutron stars. And we know of these in our galaxy. Their magnetic fields are the highest known in the universe. Um, uh, uh, upwards of um, uh, 10 hundred billion stronger than, than the sun. Uh, these are known to be unstable on the neutron star and cause uh, uh, massive explosions, typically in X-rays and gamma rays. And these have not been known for large radio, but they, they've not been known for large radio bursts, but we know there's lots of energy there that could produce radio bursts. So they were thought to a poss possible source, even though they had never shown gigantic radio bursts like you would need to explain fast radio bursts. And um, by the way, we know of a couple dozen of these in the Milky Way galaxy. And if you're curious about magnetars, I invite you to come see the McGill Magnetar catalog. You can Google that and find out lots about magnetars. But in any case, um, you might say, okay, so if you don't know what these fast radio bursts are, 
you believe they're cosmic, why don't you just go look with an optical telescope and see what's in the direction of the fast radio burst and see what galaxy it's coming from? You know, why don't you just do that? And the answer is because radio telescopes are very poor vision, poor, we call it poor angular resolution. And what we mean by that is that when the telescope tells us, oh, we've detected a fast radio burst, this is the typical uncertainty region, meaning this is the typical sky area that, um, that you, can, you can assert the source came from. So you don't know where in this giant circle it came from. And this circle for the Parkes telescope is about the size of the full moon. And inside such a large area of the sky, there's thousands of galaxies. So you, you can't know which galaxy it came from just because the radio telescope doesn't tell you very well. Now you can, you can do a little bit better by going to a larger radio telescope. And so um, the 64 meter Parkes radio telescope, it's pretty large, but there used to be at least a, a, a much bigger telescope in Puerto Rico called the Arecibo telescope, 300 meters. And you can do a little bit better, but still, even if you go to Arecibo, as we did, by the way, Arecibo, of course, for those of you who know, no longer functions. It uh, suffered a, a collapse um, a couple of years ago. Uh, but in any case, um, even the biggest, the, it was at the, the, the time, the biggest radio telescope in the world, um, it, it still doesn't help you very much. What you really need is, is, is a, a different kind of telescope, like the very large array which is an interferometer. And I'm gonna explain a little bit more about those shortly. If you could go to an interferometer, then you could pinpoint the location of the burst very easily. But the problem is the interferometer also can only see that region of the sky. And if these are transient events, you know, there's the chances of detecting one with it is, are very, very small. Um, so that's the problem. But nevertheless, we were looking for fast radio bursts at the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. And this is the former Arecibo Observatory, 300 meters in diameter. This here is a, a visitor center, fantastic, beautiful museum, a three-story museum, so you can, just to set the scale here. And um, uh, this is actually me and a couple of my colleagues standing at the very top here. This is a catwalk. You can walk on this catwalk. Uh, all the way up, it takes a few minutes, it's pretty scary. Uh, and there we are at the top in our hard, hard hats right at the pinnacle there. Uh, a lot of fun, uh, it's very sad that it no longer operates actually. But in any case, at the Arecibo Observatory, we discovered the first fast radio burst not found by the Parkes Telescope, and here it is. Uh, you can see the telltale dispersion sweep there and the insets when you correct for the dispersion in software. Um, and it looked just like every other radio, uh, fast radio burst had been detected by Parks, except it did something amazing. And we, we kept observing it with Arecibo because Arecibo is tremendously, was tremendously sensitive. And one day we were absolutely shocked because in the span of a, about an hour, it burst 10 more times. And that was the first time any fast radio burst source had ever been seen to repeat. So these are 10 bursts now with the dispersion corrected. So they're all at the same dispersion measure. So the dispersion sweep, but we've just corrected for in software so they look vertical. You could see 10 different bursts from the same source, some bright, some dim, all from the same source. And you know that was a sensation. It was, it was actually a McGill PhD student, Paul Schultz, who, who saw this first um, and uh, it, it was a massive new twist. We were not expecting this at the time at all. And it immediately ruled out all the different, uh, all every model for fast radio bursts in which the star uh, destroys itself. You know, a, a, a huge explosion, a cataclysmic explosion it ruled out. Two neutron stars colliding ruled out because it can't do it 10 times in an hour. And this source has since been seen to do this over the last few years, thousands of times. So it, it immediately, for at least for this source, ruled out a whole, uh, a whole uh, bunch of models. Um, but at the same time, it also allowed us to do something else. By finding a repeat source, we knew where we could point. And if we're just patient enough, we would detect a burst. And so we went to an interferometer, the very large array in New Mexico which is a whole bunch of radio telescopes all pointed in the same position on the sky, but separated by 
a large distance. In fact, the very large array is dishes much further away than this. Um, but they act together uh, in a way to uh, triangulate. They all detect the signal at the same time, but because light has different travel times, you can me measure the difference in arrival times of that light from the different telescopes. I'm simplifying a little bit, but that's the basic idea and pinpoint precisely on the sky. So we went and we said, we have this new repeating fast radio burst, let's look at it. And we spent 60 hours of VLA time, which is really hard to get, really hard to get. And we saw not one burst. So it's like, we knew it was bursting, but it would not cooperate, very frustrating. But we begged and begged and begged for more time. And um, uh, eventually, boom, we were patient enough uh, and they, they were kind enough to give us enough time. And um, you can see in this image of the sky for arcane reasons, it, it, the, the VLA uh, produces this, uh, looks like a star, part, a bit star pattern, but it's basically the, the, the intersection point is where the FRB is. And it's well within the uncertainty regions that were defined by the Arecibo telescope. You see, that was definitely it. And in fact, it was dispersed just at the same dispersion measure. We knew it was the source and we pinpointed it on the sky. And then so excited we went. Um, so we actually caught nine bursts. So that day it was really active and we caught nine bursts. We got a precise sky localization. And then we went to the Gemini telescope an optical telescope now so we could point at that position. We knew where to point, they gave us time and we were shocked. This is the optical image. We thought we'd see a big giant galaxy there. And, and instead there was a galaxy, but it was a tiny little galaxy. And that had us scratching our heads also, you know, in a tiny galaxy, why, you know, why sh should such a huge explosion come from such a, call it a dwarf galaxy? Big mystery. But, but in spite of that mystery, it was actually really, really wonderful because we could measure the distance to that galaxy and indeed it was at a cosmological distance. So the whole argument, the whole song and dance I gave you about the dispersion, we could confirm it in a single observation with a Gemini telescope, because we saw the galaxy, you can measure easily the distance of the galaxy, and it was bang on uh, what you would expect given all the arguments with the dispersion measure. So that was just really, really wonderful. Um, now, and we got quite a bit of press. You could see the New York Times, uh, you know, uh, they gave us a little animated thing. The New York Post suggested it could be aliens. I, I couldn't tell you why they suggested that. Um, but in any case, as of 2019, that's where we stood. We had one FRB that repeated and we didn't know what it was. We knew it ruled out a whole class of models. It enabled the first local sky localization and galaxy identification, host galaxy identification, but it left so many more questions open. Do many or all FRBs repeat? Do they all repeat and you just have to wait long enough? And what is the repeater? It doesn't answer the question, what is it? And why is it in a tiny galaxy? And we all knew that we had to, we had to find more, but it's really hard to find more of these things because you don't know when or where it's gonna go off in the sky. How do you study a phenomenon when you don't know when or where it's going to happen? You need a telescope that can look everywhere all the time. And that doesn't seem possible, except we've built one. And that's uh, what we call the CHIME telescope, the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. Um, and this, you might look at this object and say, that doesn't look like a radio telescope, but in fact it is. It, is, it has a different geometry, and I'll explain the geometry in a moment. It consists of four cylinders. So we're not using parabolic dishes. We're using uh, cylindrical paraboloids that are, this is very large. This is 20 meters by 100 meters. And we have four of them. So it's really 80 meters by 100 meters. So it has the total collecting area in Canadian units of five hockey arenas. That's a little Canadian humor there for you. Uh, it has no moving parts. You cannot steer this telescope. It only can see what is directly overhead, but these cylinders are oriented north-south so that we can observe the sky as it rotates. We observe the entire northern sky every single day. Um, uh, it, we call that a transit telescope. So the telescope observes exactly what's overhead at any one time. 
we're observing in the frequency range 400 to 800 megahertz. And the way this works is that there's 256 antennas, you can't see them here, but 256 antennas hanging along the axis of each one of these cylinders. And every one of those, so 1,024 antennas, they actually have two polarizations. So there's 2,048 input signals that are going into a massive, we call it a correlator, but you could think of it as a giant supercomputer that we have built on the site. They're being sampled and digitized in real time at a total input data rate of about 13 terabits per second. That should be a little B, sorry about that. 13 terabits per second, which is comparable to the world's cellular network, <laughs> all being collected and analyzed in real time on site. Now, um, just to set the scale here, it's a very large, you can see our team uh, standing along the axis of one of the cylinders. Um, you know, the signals from all the antennas, they get sent into these two uh, huts that are located under the dishes that you, you can't quite see them here. There's two huts underneath there. And then signals from that are uh, analyzed and sent uh, to another part of the correlator, which is located in these shipping containers. Uh, specially outfitted custom-made shipping containers on the side. And this uh, project is actually doing multiple experiments at the same time. So from the name Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, you can infer that it's actually built to map neutral hydrogen gas in the universe. Um, but at the same time, it can uh, the signal can also be used to search for um, radio bursts. And that's what we're doing. This is a little bit of a technical slide, but this is a trigger experiment. Just if there's any aficionados in the audience, um, we cannot save all this data, it's impossible. So it's a trigger experiment where we try and detect fast radio bursts in real time, buffering data so that if our trigger software, see the buffers, if our trigger software detects something, we quickly dump the buffer and save the buffered data. And uh, we have all sorts of logic going through searching um, all of the data in real time um, for these fast radio bursts. And we detect something like two or three per day. Um, yeah, you can see the locations of all of the uh, um, uh, electronic uh, uh, houses, housings on site. And here's, this is all built uh, with students and postdocs. You can see uh, a whole bunch of uh, different people who participated in the building of this fantastic uh, experiment. This is uh, the computers inside one of the shipping containers. Uh, now, why cylinders? So, you know, a conventional radio telescope like Parkes, it sees one point on the sky, one little region of the sky about the size of the full moon. But of course, as a tr fast radio bursts are transients, they're going off all over the place. It's missing the vast majority of them. It's just not in its field of view. It can't see it. But if you go to a cylinder, a cylinder focuses in one dimension only. It sees the rest of the sky as a swath all at the same time. And so if you compare the field of view of a cylindrical telescope uh, with a um, conventional radio telescope, this is Chime's field of view, how much of the sky at any one time Chime can see compared to Parks. And suddenly you realize ah, with a cylindrical telescope, you have a much, much larger area of the sky. So your chances of happening to see one of these birth sources is just much, much greater, hundreds of times greater. And that's the power of CHIME. We have such a large field of view that we can study this transient phenomenon much more effectively. And indeed, uh, when CHIME turned on, whoops, um, there we were on the cover of Nature magazine because we captured a slew of fast radio bursts. You can see here a histogram showing all of the fast radio burst detections prior to CHIME coming on. You can see the gray ones were found with the Parkes Radio Telescope and a whole bunch were found with a, a different uh, Australian uh, telescope called ASCAP, a whole bunch of those. Uh, and then once CHIME turned on, uh, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is now as of 2019, we, we started just uh, c c uh, detecting vast, vast numbers of these. Uh, very, very powerful for, for studying um, uh, the phenomenon. And, you know, since we observe the entire northern sky every single day, 
by finding so many fast radio bursts, we could just find, we, we started to find lots and lots of repeating sources. So that Arecibo repeater is not an unusual source. It turns out there's a whole you know, universe filled with them uh, that we started discovering. And by now we've published 20, 20 new uh, repeaters among hundreds of fast radio burst events that we're finding. We found about 20, so we've published 20 so far. We've actually found lots more that we're working on uh, publishing. And we're discovering all sorts of interesting phenomenology that I could talk your ear off about, but I'll, I'm, I'm running out of time. So I, I don't, uh, I'll, I'll just say, if you're interested, the repeating sources, they seem to have different burst morphologies. The bursts look a little funkier. The, the repeating ones are a little funkier uh, than the uh, apparently non-repeating ones, but that's uh, still work in progress. In 2020, we made a fantastic discovery that was just a shock to all of us. This was actually not long after we locked down for the pandemic, so we were all kind of feeling kind of bad, but the Chime telescope kept observing. It observed some, you know, in, in an automated fashion, we could all just log in from our homes um, during the pandemic. And in April of 2020, Chime detected an extremely powerful radio burst uh, from a galactic source. So from inside the galaxy, we detected a known Milky Way magnetar. And it was the first time we had ever seen a magnetar make such a luminous radio burst. And we knew instantly, oh, wow, if a magnetar can make such a bright radio burst, how would it look if we were observing some external galaxy with its own magnetar? It would look just like some of the FRBs that we detect. So we knew instantly in this detection that some fast radio bursts have to be magnetars. But we, we don't actually, I personally don't think they're all magnetars. I don't even know if most of them are magnetars. I think some of them are magnetars. And, and I, to explain why, I have to show you a little bit of a technical plot. <clears throat> so uh, forgive me a little bit. I just, one technical plot in the whole thing, um, in the whole talk. And then, and then I'll, I'll uh, just for aficionados, I just want to explain. This is now distance uh, in units of parsecs, but you could think of it in you know uh, light years, something like light years. Uh, so our galaxy is about you know on the order of ten thousand uh, light years uh, across. So on this part of the plot, this is where anything in the Milky Way sits, and so all the fast radio bursts are way on this side of the plot because they're really far away, and this is how bright they are. So don't worry about the the language here. This just means how bright they are. And so all of the galactic sources, you know, that I mentioned earlier, radio pulsars and things that were used to calibrate the free electron maps that I showed you before, uh, they're all pretty faint, you know, very low intensity. But this magnetar shot was so bright. It was many orders of magnitude brighter than anything we'd ever seen from a galactic source before. That's what we detected right after the pandemic started. And these are lines of lines of constant energy. And what we knew is that the, the energy coming from that one magnetar was similar to the lowest energy fast radio bursts we've detected, just the lowest ones. There's still lots of much more luminous, much more powerful fast radio bursts that we've detected that are millions to billions of times brighter than that magnetar. That's why I say we don't know if all of them are magnetars. We don't know all of them, but probably some of them are magnetars, seems inevitable. In the meantime, Chime has just been continuing on, you know, this, you know, it's drinking from a fire hose with Chime. We just detect an unrelenting spew of fast radio bursts thanks to this fantastic telescope. We've now published our first major catalog of fast radio bursts, over 500 sources with in-depth uh, analysis of them that I could tell you all about. And we're now sending out real time events. So you can subscribe and get an email each time we detect a fast radio burst. Here's the, the web address where you can learn how to get into our VO event service. Uh, you sign up, you can subscribe, it's free, totally free. You need to do some installation of some software, but um, uh, you can uh, be detected. And, and, and we do this not just for fun, we do this to allow our uh, colleagues around the world to try and follow up and see, can we see an optical burst or an x-ray burst at the time 
uh, of uh, these events. So we're providing the service to the world's astronomical community by sharing with very low latency. Uh, it's not, not much of a delay uh, between when we detect it. I'm talking, uh, you know, tens of seconds between when our software detects it and when that VO event signal goes out. We're working on a paper with another 30, more than 30 repeaters uh, that we've detected and soon we'll have a catalog too, hopefully within about a year with over 3000 fast radio bursts. Uh, and then I'll just mention very quickly, we are also undertaking a major new expansion of Chime. So, you know, one of the, uh, you know, problems, as I mentioned with radio telescopes is they don't have great angular resolution. If you want to know what galaxy they came from, with Chime, for repeaters, yes, for repeaters, you can do it because you know where to look. And if you're patient enough, you go to the interferometer and you pinpoint it and you identify the galaxy. But for, for one-off sources, for sources that don't repeat, wow, you've missed it, right? You have one shot at it. So how can you ever localize those? So this is our plan and we're undertaking a, a, a really, um, it's, it, it's really a, a technically extremely challenging, uh, never been done before um, experiment where we're building outrigger telescopes that look a lot like Chime. One about a hundred kilometers from where Chime is located. And uh, if I didn't say it, it, Chime is in British Columbia, uh, which is on the west, west side of Canada. And we're building another uh, outrigger telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia and another one in Hat Creek, California. And they're gonna be smaller versions of Chime that will all point at the same sky location that Chime is, 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 uh, is uh, that's overhead at Chime, whatever Chime can see. All of these are gonna point and collect data and buffer data until Chime detects something and then it will send out a signal to the outriggers and they will save their buffers. And then we're gonna combine the signals for each fast radio burst detected by all the outriggers and pinpoint the sky location um, in near real time. This is going to be a revolution in the field. We now have the detector that can detect a thousand fast radio bursts per year. That's working, <laughs> spewing them out, but Chime alone cannot sky localize them sufficiently well to identify their host galaxies. With the outriggers, we will get host, we'll know what host galaxy uh, the each of every single Chime event came from. We're gonna have a thousand host galaxies and then we can really study the types of hosts these things come from. Do they all come from spiral galaxies? How come some are from dwarf galaxies? Maybe, uh, and, and not only that, the precision with the sky localization we're gonna get from having these these outriggers separated by continental distances, thousands of kilometers. This, this is gonna allow us to identify where in the host galaxy it came from. Do they come from the center of the galaxy? Do they come from the edge of the galaxy? This is really important information for understanding their environments uh, and, and, and will be major clues to what that fast radio bursts are. But not only that, by having all the host galaxies will know the distances to all these fast radio bursts. And since we know we can see them from across the universe, we're gonna have their distribution in the universe. And because we have their dispersions, we're going to be sampling all of the free electrons along all of these different lines of sight. It is a truly novel way of studying the structure of the entire universe. This is something that's going to rewrite textbooks, a new probe. And so this isn't just a story. We are, we've already built one of the outriggers, the one that's in Allenby, British Columbia, 100 kilometers away. This is a drone photo. Uh, it's only 40 meters across. You can see here, see that little trolley? That thing, there's a person standing in there. So you get this feeling for the scale, uh, just a single cylinder. It points up because it's very close to where Chime is. They see the same sky. The Green Bank reflector is now built. It hasn't been cabled up, but you can see here in Green Bank, whoops, sorry about that. It's, it's tilted because it has to look across at the sky that Chime can see. So it, it had to be ruled a little bit. See the lovely Canadian and US flags because this is a team effort. And the Hat Creek one, we're still, uh, we're about to start construction on.
And the first light for these uh, instruments is expected, hopefully uh, in 2023, um, if we can <laughs> put it all together, there's no more world war, no more wars, no more pandemics, uh, and we can secure uh, the complete funding. So in summary, fast radio bursts are mysterious. Some of them may be magnetars, but it's really unclear presently whether all or even most of them are. Some of them repeat. We don't know if they all repeat, maybe all repeat, or maybe we have multiple classes of objects that can produce millisecond radio flashes of, of, of sufficient luminosity. Maybe there's many things that go boom in the universe to produce radio bursts. We, we just don't know. Regardless of what they are, even if we never figure out what they are, we have a fantastic new probe of the structure of the universe because we can see them to cosmological distances and they have imprinted on them information about the material through which they propagated. And I've talked about dispersion, but actually there's multiple other um, inf bits of information encoded in the radio waves that I just didn't have time to talk about, things related to their polarization and uh, to the turbulence of the plasma. And this is going to revolutionize our understanding of large scale structure in the universe. And this CHIME project in Canada is revolutionizing the field, but soon the outriggers are gonna come online and um, are gonna open up a whole new vast uh, arena for achieving uh, the uh, promise of fast radio bursts as novel probes. So I encourage you to stay tuned. Uh, here is our team and all of our wonderful uh, funders who are so supportive. Uh, and helpful. And I will leave you with a little bit of drone footage flying over the Chime telescope in British Columbia. Um, you can see, uh, yeah, quite impressive. I, I, it's, it's a several minute movie, so I won't uh, leave it for you, but I'll just uh, let you admire it uh, uh, a little bit before I stop and um, answer any questions anybody might have. There we go. I was really hoping they'd fly the drone like down the axis, but no, they didn't do that. They, in any case, there you go, uh, drone view. And I will stop, uh, stop sharing now. And thank you all very, very much for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Caspi. I felt like we were taken into the, the business of a detective and the detective story wasn't solved yet, but here you are sharing with us point by point what the detectives are doing to solve the mystery. So thank you. I, we're, we're all eager to find out more after your wonderful tour of what we know and what we don't know. So thank you very much. Oh, that's a pl pleasure. Um, I'm now going to turn things over uh, for questions uh, to Dr. Jeff Matthews. But before I introduce him, let me just remind you that it's uh, possible to ask questions by email by emailing the address astronomy at foothill.edu. And uh, Dr. Matthews has been monitoring the questions and he will continue to both ask and monitor them. I don't know how he does it, but he does it wonderfully each time. So let me turn things over to the astronomy professor at Foothill, Dr. Jeff Matthews. Thank you, Andy. And thank you again, Dr. Caspi, for, for the great talk. That, that was fantastic. And I'm also looking forward to hearing more about this uh, universal tomography that, uh, that, that y'all are taking on. Uh, now, I'm going to speak to the front of the line here, and I'm going to ask, uh, could you clarify real quick about neutron stars and magnetars? Um, you know, so, so I know that my classes haven't quite gotten to that yet, and I know I've got some students out there watching this. Yeah. So. Look, neutron stars, they're the um, remnants of massive stars that have collapsed uh, after they've run out of their nuclear fuel that you know, supports them. Uh, so uh, it's a gravitational collapse. They haven't quite collapsed to black holes. Uh, so they still have a, a surface and we observe, we know thousands of them in our own galaxy. They, um, some of them for reasons that are not fully understood are endowed with a really massive magnetic field. Now, Actually, all neutron stars have some magnetic field that is still pretty powerful compared to terrestrial standards, but some of them have super high magnetic fields. And um, at those field strengths, the fields uh, are 
have caused instabilities in the structure of the star. We're not sure if it's just, if, if it causes surface cracking um, or if it's a magnetosphere that is the environment around the star. Um, sometimes there could be magnetic reconnection events, but basically there's uh, instabilities inside the star that are um, seen mainly with the highest magnetic field objects. And those lead to these kinds of uh, bursting behavior that we typically see in X-rays and gamma rays and, and have seen since the 1970s using X-ray and gamma ray satellites. So it's a small class. So you know, we know thousands of neutron stars in our galaxy, but only a couple dozen are magnetars. So they're rare, they're not common. Got it, okay. And so then we've got several questions that have come in about uh, sort of accompanying observations or follow-up observations. So I'll ask some of those. Uh, so uh, one question uh, has that, that came in was um, from Corey asking, aren't there like cameras that can take pictures of the whole moon? So couldn't you just have a telescope like that made to uh, swing to the full moon spot where the burst happened and look for it? Um, yes, so there are, there, there's definitely lots of, um, there, not lots, but there are telescopes. So for example, you know, people follow supernovae and, uh, but this, remember this is a millisecond long. So, um, and, and not only that, the radio waves are delayed. So in reality, part of the challenge here is that if there were a short optical burst, so, so the, okay, the question is two different questions. Are you looking for a short optical burst, you know, the, what we call the prompt emission that accompanies the radio burst, or are you interested in the galaxy afterward? So if you're interested in the optical burst, well, you had to have been observing before you detected the radio burst. That's the problem because the radio waves get delayed. Optical light doesn't get delayed in the same way. So what you need to do is have a telescope that's looking at the same region of the sky that Chime is and hope you you have data there from uh, the same time as the as the radio burst does. And um, so wide field optical cameras don't always have very good time resolution. In fact, typically they don't have millisecond time res resolution. And so it's typically they'll have one minute, 30 seconds. And if you want good sensitivity, you have to integrate for long. So you don't have that kind of uh, time resolution. Now, technology is going to improve. Technology improved, maybe one day this will be possible, but currently if for the typical optical telescope, no, it's not. Now to maybe your question is just a bit detecting the optical galaxy. Yeah, but, but like I say, you don't know where in the full moon region it is. And there's a thousand galaxies there. So you don't know which one of them have the FRB source in it. That's the problem. Right, that trade-off in sort of your area coverage versus your sensitivity. Yes. Uh, so we've got a question um, from KL asking, do fast radio bursts come along with gravitational waves, which could be detected by LIGO? Yeah, so the, we, we, so, um, we uh, so, so first of all, so LIGO detects uh, um, uh, gravitational wave sources um, but their error regions, the, the area of the sky where they can pinpoint them are, are gargantuan compared to even what Chime. So when I say full moon for Chime, for LIGO, it's, you know, half the sky. It, it, they, they don't pinpoint it very well at all. So, so it's hard for us to say, but we are looking and, and there are, there is one claim that perhaps one of the LIGO events uh, was coincident with one of our Chime catalog events, but they were not exactly at the same time. And um, uh, it, basically, you know, most of the fast radio bursts that we detect, the vast majority, we infer are from much, much larger distances in the universe than LIGO can actually see. So it's not impossible that one day we will get a fast radio burst from a LIGO event, but it will have to be one of the particularly nearby LIGO events. And most LIGO events actually are black hole, black hole mergers where you don't expect any, any kind of light at all. So you need a neutron star black hole or a neutron star neutron star merger. That is gonna be the LIGO event and has to be really nearby. And it'll have to be pretty well localized for us to be able to 
be certain that it was that fast radio burst that, that to, to associate them. So what your, your question is a great one. And it's the sort of thing we sit and argue about. So how, how can we do this? But we haven't done it yet. And we would love to love to, I'd love to do that. All right. And, and there's a similar question as well about uh, GRBs, about gamma ray bursts. Um, a a yeah. question from Pierre based, asking basically the same thing. So I have a PhD student at McGill University. Her name is Alice Curtin, who has just submitted a paper to the Astrophysical Journal taking a whole all of the gamma ray bursts that have been detected um, in the last couple of years and seeing how many of them were in the sky at the transit time of Chime. And there were some that were pretty close. Um, and you had to get lucky because because the transit time, the, the time any position on the sky is overhead at time is only about 15 minutes a day. So, you know, but there's a lot of gamma ray bursts. So there's a few that were we had sensitivity to in principle and we did not detect anything. Uh, and but so what we could do is put some pretty interesting upper limits. The first actually really strong upper limits on radio emission uh, from gamma ray bursts. So we haven't detected, but it doesn't mean we're not going to detect in the future. We're going to keep looking. Got it. And so now I'm going to transition into questions uh, sort of on, on the technical side about the tools. Um, there were multiple emails basically asking the same question. Um, with that much data and nodes and engines, you must have an entire department dealing with software engineers. But really, though, how big is your team? Yeah. So, um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you know, a, a, a project of the scale of, of Chime, if it were in, you know, in the commercial realm <laughs> or in the government realm, would probably have many dozens, uh, I think, of, of software engineers. And uh, we have uh, three, three and a half. Uh, so how do we do it? Um, the, 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 these people are unbelievably gifted talented they work incredibly hard they do it because they love it because they want to understand these things and we also have phd students masters and phd students and postdocs who are helping write all of the software uh, so it is extremely challenging it is one of our biggest problems and it just has to do with uh it, it, it's it's about funding it's it, it comes down to um uh, the challenges of running a big project like this, um, you know, we can do this. We can solve this problem. Uh, we're so close, but uh, we do not have a big team at all. And I have to say kudos to our unbelievably technically gifted team that makes this thing a reality on a shoestring. I, I am so proud of this, of, of our Chime team. Thank you for that question. And. Um... Another question about possibly the future, um, would placing a couple of radio telescopes in orbit, similar to Webb, um, help to triangulate and decrease radio interference from Earth? Oh, interesting question. Yeah, so um, for, uh, you know, there's, there's this wonderful radio telescope, it's more, more um, millimeter wave, but it's called the Event Horizon Telescope. Some of you might've heard of it because it recently imaged the black hole event horizon from the M87 galaxy and also from the center of our own galaxy. Uh, and there, the name of the game is, is uh, precision angular resolution. You want to precisely um, uh, pinpoint things on the sky. And so they want also continental baselines, continental distances between radio telescopes. And the next realm exactly for them is exactly what you're asking is to put one in orbit and get one even further. And then you could really image lots and lots of black holes in the universe. For fast radio bursts, we don't need that kind of distance. That, that would not be great for us because just getting the, the thousand kilometer baselines that we have uh, here in North America, that gets us to within a galaxy and that's good enough for us. We don't need better than that. But for applications like imaging black hole event, supermassive black hole event horizons, like the Event Horizon Telescope does, you absolutely want to go to space. Absolutely. Now, of course, the challenge in going to space is that for, for good sensitivity, you want a very large reflector. Hard to launch that. So you'd probably fold it up. 
But you know, anytime you have moving parts that are deployed in, in, in a space environment, it's it's not easy. And now James Webb, you know, hats off to James Webb. What a, what an unbelievably unbelievable technical job they did. That thing is a thing of great beauty. But that's uh, still small compared to what you'd really want for the sensitivities that you're after for, uh, unless what you could do is launch a whole, I'm just thinking, uh, uh, you know, launch a fleet of them, lots of little ones that you could do, but it gets expensive, but you, you know, that's, it could be the future. That'd be so cool. Right. And, and of course, with, you know, costs for space flights coming down. <laughs> right. Yes. Now, so um, one last question about just sort of the technical side of all of this. Um, I got a question from Shay asking, why are you throwing away all that data from the outriggers? Yeah, so, um, you know, so first of all, you know, there's many, many stages of the data, uh, of the data acquisition. The 13 terabits a second that comes the raw data rate, there's no, you can't collect, you can't save 13, terabits per second like, you just, like no technology say i could do that now we we analyze that down within the first set um, uh, of the correlator the first the first um uh stage two stages of the correlator and then the input data rate into the fast radio burst detection system is about um, 142 gigabits a second and even that is really you know it is really hard to save you just can't, you know, it would just pile up and um, we don't have the resources to do that. We don't have the resources. And so if you want to um, to have a practical experiment, you have to, you, you need trade-offs. You have to make tough decisions. And so what we have is a, a, a trigger system where we're finding things in real time, but it's pretty conservative. So we actually save a lot more than, than just fast radio, but we save a lot of iffy things that in the end are garbage. And we have them, we, we save them all on disk and it's actually helpful. So for example, we employ uh, our, our, our machine learning out artificial intelligence algorithms to help pick out these signals that we're looking for because we know what they should look, they should have that nice dispersion sweep. So uh, we want to be able to train those algorithms to train them. You need things that don't look like them also. So we will collect a lot of junk and, um, uh, and save that. But, you, but it's a trade-off. You don't want to collect too much because we, we don't have the resources to be able to, to store it all. Got it. So if, if, if you had infinite hard drives, <laughs> no, no problem. But <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, or it'd still be a problem because you'd still have to sort through it all. Got it. Yeah, and our um, poor three and a half program or three and a half software engineers, you know, to <laughs> have to deal with all that. No, no right, little... too much of a haystack. Right, right. And uh, speaking of searching for needles in the haystack, um, multiple people emailed in asking about sort of using your observations for double duty for SETI searches. So with questions about things like, are these at the same frequencies that SETI is, is usually looking at? Um, you know, are, are you looking at the right parts of the galaxy for SETI? Uh, so several questions along those lines. Yeah, so we have sometimes discussed this uh, with, the, um, with the SETI folks. Uh, typically, they look at uh, higher radio frequencies than, than um, we do particularly if you want to look in the plane of the, of the galaxy. Uh, and that's because in the plane of the Milky Way galaxy, which, which is where most of the stars in the Milky Way are, um, there's, there's a lot of material there. There's a lot of, um, a lot of plasma and the plasma is uh, not distributed uniformly. And so you end up with a phenomenon that's called scattering where uh, a short burst of radio waves actually gets uh, tremendously broadened in time and, and sometimes can even wash it out so you, it's undetectable. So I, I think a lot of the SETI searches will tend to go to higher radio frequency than CHIME does for exactly that reason. Um, but on the other hand, uh, um, there are uh, other, um, uh, uh, my, I have colleagues who will use SETI uh, type detection um, instruments in order, which are have been designed for SETI type searches, 
at higher frequencies to try and see what the frequency extent of fast radio bursts are. So uh, they'll, they'll go to, so at Chime, we can't change what frequency we're at. We're, we're at 400 to 800 megahertz. They're all nailed in there, those, those, <laughs> those antennas. But for example, at the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia, um, you can choose what frequency you go at. So the SETI people will sometimes take their, infrastructure, their, their experiment to Green Bank and they will look at some of Chime fast radio bursts to see how high in frequency they go. And they've, they've done some really beautiful, beautiful work that way. So it's gone a little bit more in the opposite direction that the listener asked. Uh, but in principle, we could do SETI experiments. And um, uh, yeah, it's, it's something we could do. We've just been focused on, on other things, but it's uh, not impossible. It would take more resources. I mean, Right, got it, yeah. Um, so there, there's a question from Tran asking, um, if there's so many of these fast radio bursts, uh, why were they only discovered in 2007? Yeah, yeah, great question. And the answer is computing. You know, we didn't have the capability. So multi multiple reasons, you know, to first of all, we, they were found, the Lorimer burst was found at the Parkes telescope in a search for radio pulsars. And um, we thought we knew radio pulsars were only in our galaxy, or at least we only had the sensitivity to detect them in our galaxy. So we only searched out to dispersion measures that were consistent with the edge of the galaxy. We didn't look beyond. Now, um, and also, we didn't look, we only started looking for single bursts. Um, that was not long before, uh, so maybe in 20, 2006, we started fine because we didn't think radio pulsars would ever produce single bursts. So it's, it's the radio pulsar community that's, that found these events by luck because what happened was they were looking um, in the sky um, out. Of, so the, maybe this is too many, I'm giving you too much information, but you know, in the plane of the Milky Way galaxy, you expect a lot more dispersion. And so you search to higher dispersion measures if you're looking in the plane. And so what the team was doing was actually looking way out of the plane, but they, by mistake, were looking at, out to the same dispersion measures you'd look out in the plane. And so that's how they happened upon, and they were looking for single bursts, which was something, you know, you have to fast sample the data, you can't do... I mean, I'm using some technical sort of Fourier transforms is how you look for periodic signals, which is how we did all the pulsar surgery. Anyway, the point is they were doing something different than what they normally did, not expecting to find this. And it just goes to show that when you just um, stick with what you know, you miss stuff. Anyway, so it, the, the short answer to your question, to the long story short, is computing became, um, made it more feasible and um, you could fast sample the data. And then something like Chime, it's just a mammoth computing. If we didn't have gaming, gaming, all you gamers out there, you've enabled Chime because uh, the correlator is made of GPUs, uh, graphic processing units and, um, and, and CPUs as well. So, it, 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 and those, the prices of those uh, came down um, enough that we could afford to build this massive radio telescope out of GPUs and CPUs. I mean, it's basically driven by the commercial gaming industry. Wow, <laughs> I, I'm kind of floored by that. That that's uh, that that's fantastic. Um, this sort of feedback between different parts of different aspects of, of humanity, you know. Yes. And, yes. And how we how we behave. Uh, all right. So, uh, so I, I I'm going to apologize up front to all the people. So many questions have come in. We're not going to be able to get to them all. We're just going to have our final couple of questions here um, uh, as, we, as we go into wrapping up. And so got a question from Edward asking, um, if the radio burst is dispersed by free, free electrons, why is there no effect by free protons? So right. or, or is space somehow mostly negative rather than neutral? No, it, the the only so um, the, the effect is strong. Uh, uh, so the, the, basically, the the proton is two thousand times more massive than the electron, and so when you have an electromagnetic wave, 
basically you have an oscillating electric field. When it encounters a proton, ah, it's really hard to accelerate that proton. Whereas an electron is so much lighter, it accelerates it so much more easily. I mean, this comes down to electromagnetic theory, e and M, uh, if you've taken it. Basically, yes, in principle, protons contribute, but they contribute in such a minor way uh, compared to the electrons, mainly because they're much more massive. Okay, got it. And so because they don't sort of get you know moved around as much, they're not yes. affecting, they're not affecting back the, the waves. Yes, exactly. And with a few more minutes, I could probably come up with a more coherent way of saying that. But <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, um, okay, yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to move on to the the, 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 the last question uh, that we're going to ask this evening uh, from, from Priya uh, asking, uh, wasn't, wasn't there some supernova that was seen again and again because of gravity lenses? So couldn't that be causing um, a radio burst to, to show up again and again? Yes, I, I understand. You're asking about gravitational lensing. Um, th there are cases where you can, where gravitate, where a supernova could be gravitationally lens, but, you know, I think the, those kinds of systems, you might see three, four, five images. You don't see a thousand, you know, so some of our repeaters have now been seen to repeat over a thousand times. Um, and, um, I would say, though, that it's not impossible that a fast radio burst source could get gravitationally lensed. Uh, there's actually papers in the literature suggesting that you could, in principle, detect gravitationally lensed fast radio bursts. And we have, in fact, our team has done a search through uh, all of the detected events to see, are, is there any evidence for lensing uh, amongst the CHIME first catalog? And we did not find any. But if we were to find them, um, the, 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 the mass scale that's relevant for millisecond type radio bursts corresponds to sort of intermediate mass black holes for which there's not a lot of other observational constraints. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that gravitational lensing of fast radio bursts is one potential way of uh, constraining, you know, one of the possible um, uh, sources of the dark matter. Uh, there's not a lot of observational handles on black holes of a certain uh, mass range, although LIGO is certainly providing more, more and more information on that. So lensing of fast radio bursts is possible, but we haven't yet detected it. And, and certainly it can't explain some of the, rep the repeaters where we see them over and over and over again. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let me first of all thank you again, Dr. Caspi, for taking us on this journey into the known and the unknown. Um, we really appreciate it, and we look forward to inviting you back when the puzzle is solved. Maybe. Oh, I, I <laughs> hope we'll solve it soon. <laughs> That's right. I'll be happy well, to come back. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I should remind everyone that we have six Silicon Valley astronomy lectures every year. Our next one is going to be Wednesday evening, December 7th, again at 7 p.m. Pacific time, when we've invited Dr. Tom Berger of the University of Colorado to tell us about space weather, to talk about activity on a much smaller scale than we've been talking about tonight, about the activity of the sun and how the sun's strong magnetic field and activity affects uh, conditions here on Earth. Uh, so we look forward to having you join us on December 7th. Until then, this is Andrew Fracknoy saying thank you for watching the Silicon Valley Astronomy Lectures, and please explore our past catalog at the same YouTube site. Good evening.